الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين نستعينه نستغفره ونؤمن به عز وجل ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم and that is with Allah's name the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. The praise belongs to Allah, the evolver of all systems of knowledge. We seek his assistance, we seek and beg for his forgiveness. We express firm faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, highly glorified is he, for he is the mighty and the sublime. We witness as Muslims <clears throat> that none empowers except for Allah, who is one alone with no shareholders. And we witness that Muhammad وسلم, is his slave servant and messenger. May the prayers and peace be upon him. As we have been instructed to say in the Quran, after the mentioning of Muhammad's name, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, translated in some cases as peace and blessings be upon him, prayers and peace be upon him, and due to the limitations for definitions in the English language, it is very hard to translate many of the Quranic words and phrases and terms in a way that satisfies the English intellect. And that is the English speaking intellect. But suffice it to say that if we follow our simple logic in making determinations for definitions in the Quran, just follow what you already know and ask Allah to bless you with additional insight based on the sincerity that you bring. Then a phrase like Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will become increasingly easier and more palatable for us to understand as a statement relating to the Prophet himself. Sallallahu literally says the Salat of Allah. Think about that. The Salah of Allah. Translated, the prayers of Allah. May the prayers of Allah be upon Muhammad. Does Allah pray? With our common sense Muslim mind, we have already struck out all ideas related to the idea of Allah praying to anybody or anything. We know that Allah has created everything in matter, in created matter, with its own mode of salah, as he tells us in the Quran. But what it tells us also, and that is those of us who think with logical deduction, based on logical deduction. It tells us that because this phrase is in the Quran, it must mean something, and that something must be substantially different than what we have been told. Most of us have, as Muslims have been informed concerning the word salat in a way that suggests that it only pertains to the ritual prayer, quote unquote that we are taught to make minimum five times a day as Muslims. That is our obligation. However, Allah is more than capable of taking one term and extracting multiple meanings out of that one term. The difference between how Allah does it and how a human would do it is that the human being's multiple definitions will be running into each other. 
and in some cases will contradict each other. But the multiple definitions that Allah will pull out of one word will all have related meaning. So let us take a look very quickly at this term, Salah, the Salah of Allah. Again, Allah says in the Quran that all creatures, everything in creation, knows its mode of salah. Does that mean that the giraffe makes salah as we know salah? Does that mean that the birds that fly high up into the sky make salah as we are taught salah? The average mind among us would say no. Then again, this term salah must mean something substantially different in some cases. What those things do have in common, however, is the idea of an instinctive nature that Allah created in everything that he produced. And that instinctive nature is inbred, inborn, innate in that aspect of created matter, and it follows that instinctive nature. Without fail. The birds have been doing what they do for millions, possibly billions of years. Building a nest, the same bird, if it's the same bird, it's building basically the same nest a million years later. The same roach, they say, that existed in the kingdoms of ancient Egypt 4,000, 6,000 years ago is the same roast that we find in Harlem, New York, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, bothering us. Same roach. Because its instinctive nature, what it has been taught to do by its guardian lord and evolver, its creator, is instinctively bred within the DNA fabric of that creature. And it cannot change. The only creature capable of coming outside of their instinctive modality is the human creature. And the human creature has even been gifted with the ability to go into other life kingdoms, the animal kingdom, for instance, and take an animal and bring it outside of its selected mode. So you might find a situation where a great big old black bear is standing on its hind legs in a dress doing a dance because a human being said so. A little poodle in a little tutu doing a little dance because a human being said, that's cute, I'm going to train it to do that. Fleas, huh? Yeah. Dancing and jumping out of jars because a human being said so. The human being has been given a great ability and a great potential by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the prayers of Allah are not ritualistic. Allah uses this term salah to represent the preservational mode that he creates. The idea of him creating a thing and then instilling in that thing its own means of preservation. This term salat is where the English-speaking pe uh, English people get the word salt. You see how closely they are related? Salat, salt. Because they studied the Quran meticulously. The Quran is what produced the European Renaissance, in case you didn't know. 12th century, 13th century, 14th. The sciences that came into the European lands and removed them from what they themselves were calling the Dark Ages. Wasn't the Bible that they that they had the Bible up under their arms for 300 years during the Dark Ages? It was the exposure to the light of the Quran that brought them into that kind of scientific intelligence. So they began to extract various definitions from the Quran 
for things in their society, in their budding society, that they felt had value and worth, especially in terms of the sciences, economics, government, etc. The ancient seafarers were people who traded in salt before they were dollar bills. The most valuable commodity in the world, in the old world, was salt. Now you might look at that salt shaker on your table and not be able to put <laughs> that together with what I'm saying. But if you understand salt as big blocks of material, that was used before the days of refrigeration to preserve the integrity of the meats that had to be transported sometimes across oceans and seas. You were able to pack that meat in salt and the salt would serve as the major preservative that would allow for that meat to reach its destination with as minimal amount of depreciation as possible. And the salt would also serve to extract the poisons out of the meat. So it makes perfect sense why they would call that commodity salt after studying what salat is supposed to do in the life of the Muslim. The salat is designed to preserve the integrity of your Muslim life. And the salat is designed to pull out all of the cultural, academic poisons that this world of artificiality put into your system. So when again, again, when Allah says sallallahu, he is saying that this is his method, his direct method of preserving what? The integrity of Muhammad's sunnah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah is telling us to ask him, which is a way of us being remindful and mindful of the fact that Muhammad's sunnah, is the focus for human life. He is the prototypical human being. And we're asking that with all that will be said about him in history, written about him in history books, spoken about him on the streets or in the colleges and universities, that above all of that fracas, above all of the lies that might be told, that Allah himself will preserve the integrity of the true image of Muhammad. That's just the intro. That's not the subject. We first and foremost ask Allah to bless our hajis and our hajjas to fulfill their obligations to him and that he will return them safely to their loved ones and to their respective communities. We ask that Allah bless them with endurance and fortitude as they journey through the land that many prophets and messengers' feet have traveled upon. Have mercy on them and increase in all of us the light of faith and deeds and help us to do deeds of not only faith but good works, reconciliation. Reconciliation. Ya ayyuhal al-mu'minun, O you who exhibit faith, the Quran, as we all know, is our book of guidance. It provides for us the wisdom, knowledge, and the understanding that is inherent within the fitra of created matter itself. By fitra, we're talking about the innate pattern that Allah put into everything he created. The way it behaves. For lack of a better explanation, I think that's a good explanation. Allah created everything with a behavioral mode. The Quran contains keys for bringing the human life back into accord with its fitra origin. Whenever that life gets out of sync with its inherent possibilities. The Quran also reestablishes the default setting. If you know anything about computers, you're recognizing this terminology. The Quran reestablishes the default setting just as a computer repair person would do in order to save a computer from imminent crash.
crash, from an imminent crash. When all is said and done, you might have to do without some of your most cherished programs. Huh? The programmer will tell you, listen, I, I can save your computer, but I can't save all of these programs. In fact, there might be one or two or three of these programs that are actually responsible for the crash. <laughs> and as Muslims, we have picked up many terms and interpretations of terms that represent the negative virus-laden programs that are causing many of our Muslim lives to crash with the Quran in one hand and with the Sunnah on our lips. Much of what we have been given as tafsir of the Quran has come from Muslim scholars who were very much influenced by the popularity of Jewish and Christian scholars and who found themselves acquiescing to the interpretations and interpolations invented by these scholars for explanations in their respective scriptures. They would look at their Torah and their Injil and they would see where the subject of women would be broached in their scripture. And they would come up with all kinds of ideas related to what that means in the life of the human person. What value does that creature have in the life of human society? And whether you understand it or not, modern day ideas related to racism Sexism, the difference in economic positioning and stratas, the, prefer the preferential treatment of the rich versus the poor, all of these ideas that have poisoned society have their origin in scripture of one form or another. The misreading and sometimes the deliberate misinterpretation and interpolation of scripture. And again, there are Muslim scholars in Muslim history that were too lazy to investigate the Quran with independent minds. So when it came to the question of what Allah was saying about the women, or about the color black, or about the color white, Instead of investigating the Quran by comparing the Quran with the Quran, they compared the Quran with previous scriptures and what previous scholars had to say about those same topics in their books. Not understanding that the Quran is speaking to those same topics in order to correct the incorrect picture that previous scriptures had been purporting because of misinterpretations, misinformation. Allah revealed the Quran to set the record straight on the most important matters in human life. These negative views were adopted wholesale in some cases and written into books of theology by so-called Muslim scholars. And they are especially prevalent in the numerous fabricated hadith that other scholars tell us about. They say that the majority of hadith that had been uncovered by those who saw it as their duty to investigate hadith, the majority, thousands upon thousands, are deemed weak and of no value in the Muslim life. And believe it or not, people still follow them. They say, they tell you this one is naive. And people still use it. And some of the strongest ones are some of the most common sense ones. And people walk around it. Love for your brother and sister, what you love for yourself. Ah, that sounds too Christian. Muslims are not supposed to love. We're about to 
knowledge. You see the imbalance that comes when you don't understand terminology? The greatest book of love on earth is the Quran. Pure love. Balanced love. These wrongly interpreted ideas went as far as influencing the explanations of Quranic terms itself. Terms such as mu'min, we use it all the time. Kafir, we throw that word around like it's a ping pong ball. All you got to do is have a relative who still believes in Jesus and she's a Kafir. Grandma, changed our funky diapers, put food in our bellies when mama didn't have the time, when daddy was absent. Grandma taught you your first words in some cases. All of a sudden now, we say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad or Rasulullah, and because she still says, Jesus loves you, she's a Catholic. Where do we get that definition? Certainly not from the Quran. Munafik. Oh, you hypocrite. Where do we get that definition? That a munafik is what is described in the English word hypocrite. Understand this. These definitions or interpretations of Quranic terminology were strategically designed to take the sting out of them with the passage of time. And that was done by the grand schemer called as Shaitan in the Quran. Shaitan himself had a hand in designing definitions and interpretations of words in scripture. And when he would translate these things into other languages, he would use words in those languages that were designed to take the sting and take the focus out of what Allah was putting the focus on. Shaitan, I remind us, is the avowed enemy of the human being. Words, as we know, make people. Human beings, as we know, are products of word or language environments. The easiest and most effective way to defeat a human being is to take away the two legs of moral and rational thinking. That is how we suffer defeat. Spelled D E dash F E E T. Yeah, if you understand your moral and rational thinking to be your two legs that help to advance your human life, if they take away moral and rational thinking, they have taken away your legs. And if they take away your legs, your feet go with it, hence, you have been defeated. As human beings, we are created by Allah to exhibit excellence, excellence on the levels of moral and rational life and activity. Moral thinking and rational application is what separates the potential in humans from all of the other instinctive life Allah has created that operate based on prompts. The first major surah of the Quran called Al-Baqarah, translated as the cow. I'm sure you've seen that as a translation. That's, that's a part of the problem. Al-Baqarah, the cow? Baqarah is not a cow. Some come closer and say heifer. A cow is not a cow until after she has born a baby called a calf. And a calf is not a cow. What exists between the calf and the cow is the heifer. A heifer has not become a mother. So to say el bakara, you know, there's a similar word that means virgin, virgin land. So that should tell you something. So the ones that say the heifer are closer to the right definition. 
but to just say the cow shows that there were people who were not schooled enough in the English language to bring us the correct interpretation. And the difference between being a mother and not being a mother is tremendous. Grandma used to say to that same daughter that's probably now calling her a cow, girl, don't you go out there messing around with them heifers. <coughs> When you go to school, don't be messing around with them little heifers. And she was talking about the little girls that were just beginning to blossom, just beginning to bloom, but in their minds, they thought they were older than they were. So they began to wear their sweater a little more loose, a little more tight, a little more revealing. They began to pull that skirt up a, a, a few inches higher in order to attract the interest of the males in school. And grandma would see that and she'd recognize it and she'd say, girl, but yes, look, daughter, granddaughter, don't mess around with that help. <coughs> I mean, she was exaggerating her worth. She was exaggerating her value. <coughs> she was exaggerating even her experience in the world. So when Allah says to sacrifice the heifer, oh, there's a lot that goes into that definition if you understand it to be a heifer and not a full-grown cow. We're talking about concepts in the Qur'an. <coughs> Al-Baqarah presents its first major theme in Ayat 1 through 20. And a broad overview is being established of what the human being is. Who is better to tell us what the human being is than the one who created the human being? As Muslims, we are not to see the world through so-called secular eyes. We are to view the world through the lenses of Islamic terminology and identification. These themes that Allah is outlining for us define for us how Allah establishes our identity. And that is the identity that should be most precious to us as Muslims. According to the Quran, there are essentially three groups of people. There are the mutaqtis, the possessors of taqwa, there is the kuffar, and there is the munafiq. The meanings of these words have been systematically watered down over time so that, again, the original gravity of the word, as Allah gave it, cannot uh, uh, pardon me, uh, and as, as the prophet also understood it in his day and time, that original weight that came along with that term when it reached the people's ears, that original weight is not inherent in those definitions today, 2011 going into 2012. It was lost. Mutaki cannot be simply translated as pious. Oh, the Muslims, they are pious. They are God-fearing. Kafir came to be incorrectly known as a disbeliever or a heathen. And Munafik has been simply rendered as hypocrites. Now listen very carefully to the remaining parts of this presentation. This modern world has been under the awesome pressure of social engineers and psychological controllers who sought to dominate the minds of the masses through the invention of language as a tool used to fabricate ideas, customs, and values that would supersede or take the place of those ideas, customs, and values established by Allah through his scriptures. Some have gone as far as to change the wording of the very scripture itself in order to reflect their schemes. Allah tells us of that in the Quran. They write the book with their own hands. And they say, this is from Allah. This is from God. Go through 
through this council, that council, that council, take these scriptures. This doesn't fit our purpose. Burn those. Hide those. Give them this and tell them this is from God. The difference is this. What Allah established in scripture was originally in sync with the natural patterns found in the fitrah. And it provided the human being with a life that supported the journey from his essence to his excellence. It was intended to deliver him safely into the hands of the latter life called al akhirah The Quran was revealed in order to resurrect that opportunity for man. After that opportunity had been crippled because of the manipulations found in previous scriptures. This world's knowledge takes man off of the Sirat al-Mustaqim and it plants his feet on the unsure foundations of guesswork that they call theories. That's all a theory is. It's an educated guess. And they tell you that in the dictionary definition. But it was not the secular scientists who first introduced this scheme. It was the priestly classes of the masquerading saints that did this to the world. The mutakti are those who possess taqwa. And taqwa is from the root word waqqa. And words from that same root are used throughout multiple ayat in the Quran. None of these words represent passive dispositions. That's my point. Hmm? Pious. Believer. See, those are, those are passive descriptions. Whereas when you look up the other words that are related to the same root as the word taqwa, you're going to find it related to one who is engaged in action. The action of warding off, defending, guarding, protecting, fortifying, shielding, and sheltering. That's the mutaki. What is the purpose of all of this taqwa? All of this warding off, this guarding, this defending, this fortifying. The purpose is to preserve the integrity of the life of human excellence in the world. And that begins with a conscious awareness of who Allah is, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The mu'min is the possessor of taqwa. The mu'min bears witness to the omniscience, the omnipresence, and the omnipotence of Allah. Therefore, the mu'min, by his very nature, has as an emphasis for life the conscious use of this, the forebrain. <laughs> we taught on that brain last time I was here. Huh? Do you know that you can't possess taqwa and your taqwa cannot develop without you using this consciously, this forebrain, this neocortex? Do you know that taqwa is, that Allah says, so that they may learn you can't learn without this neocortex. We are not to rest on the comforts of subconscious, emotionally charged animal behavior. That's just your subconscious life. The average animal has the same life. Instinctive life. Wanting to eat. Wanting to sleep. Wanting to play, wanting to do some work, wanting to have sex and procreate, and then dying. All of that is regulated by the subconscious impulses in you. You don't need an education for that. You don't need instruction. You don't need scripture for that. All you need is to tend to your animalistic motivations. Which Allah calls in the Quran, your ahwa. And Allah also says in the Quran that the worst of creatures on earth are those who take their own ahwa as their ilah. The worst. Your lower passion said, he didn't create this wonderfully uh, uh, conditioned creature. Stand us up on two feet. Put a neocortex in the front of his head to think his way through and actually improve upon creation. You don't believe the human being improves upon Allah's creation? 
Allah doesn't give you complete creation. If you don't believe that, leave your lawn alone. <laughs> leave your hair and your nails alone. And tell me how civilized you will be able to present yourself in another couple of weeks or couple of months. No, Allah gives you raw material to work with. And then he puts your brain to work. How can I make this more palatable and more comfortable for human life? Alhamdulillah. Allahu Akbar. We as human beings are to establish the modus operandi which sets the pace for the life dedicated to the service of Allah through our conscious participation in creation. We are his caretaker, his khalifa fil ard in the earth. And Muhammad the Prophet وسلم, is the prototype for establishing that model person on earth. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ala Muhammad kama salli ta'ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim. Wa baraka Allah Muhammadin wa ala ala Muhammad kama baraka ta'ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim fi al-alameen innaka hamidu majid. So in closing this discussion on the Mutaki, the Mutaki actually represents the most quality human walking the planet Earth. And the Quran is a book that directly benefits only those who actively seek to develop this quality of taqwa in themselves. Allah says in the Quran, Alif Lam Mim, Zalik al Kitabu la Raiba fihi hudal lil Muttaqin. This is the book, there is no double talk in it. <laughs> it is guidance for the mutaqeen, the possessors of taqwa. <laughs> Who believe with the assistance of the unseen. That's science. Huh? The Mu'min is able to bring you things that you can't even see to support his argument. Imam Mikhail just gave you an example in the atom. Yeah. Much of what science has discovered in the world of the unseen has given us a much greater appreciation for the seen. وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ وَمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ وَبِالْأَخِرَةِ هُمْ يُؤْمِنُونَ And who believe in what has been sent down to you, speaking to Muhammad, present peace be upon him, and what has been sent down from before you, previous scriptures, previous prophets and messengers, peace be upon them, and of the latter life they are sure, they are convinced. They are upon guidance. They are situated. They are supported by the Huda. And it is they who will be of Al Muflihun. Al Muflihun is from the same word as the word we use in the Adhan, Falah. Hayya al Falah. And we translate it sometimes as come to success. Huh? So they will be of the successful. But why are they successful is the question. That verb falaha also gives us a common word for one who does farming. The farmer. So Allah is not just giving us some passive description of those who will meet with success. Allah, through this one term, al muflihun is also giving us the strategy by which we have to follow in order for the success to manifest. 
you have to look at the concrete, literal way that a farmer becomes successful at planting a seed, giving that seed the proper environmental circumstances to grow, warding off all of the negative things, the weeds and whatever that will be in that environment that might possibly cause the stagnation or the death of that uh, growing, budding life. and how to dispense with it, how to bring it to market in order to get the best value out of the thing that Allah blessed you to plant in that earth. That is success. Now if we, are to, if we take that concrete idea and transfer it, translate it to the abstract world of ideas and concepts, then if we follow that same fitrah pattern in the abstract world, in the world of our relationships with people, with our family members, with our community members. Huh? We don't just go like wild weeds and pull up tender life, whispering things in people's ears and they don't even know what the hell you're talking about. Hey, you heard about the imam over there? Oh, uh, imam, what's his name? <laughs> no, man, I got to tell you what he did, man. You know, and after he goes through all of that, you find out he's talking about something that happened 42 years ago. Well, he even knew what any man was. You don't do that. That's not a successful farmer. And a farmer doesn't go to another man's farm and pull up all of his roots and his plants and then replant them in his garden. That's not a farmer. But that's what we do. When we go to some other ideology, as some of these Muslim scholars did, and uproot their ideas, their concepts, their interpretations, and bring them back, put them in books, put Islam on it, and sell it to us. Inna ladina kafaru sawa'un alayhim anartahum amlam tundirhum la yu'minun As to those who reject faith, speaking of the Kufar. It is equal to them. It is the same to them. Whether you warn them or do not warn them, they will not be given to belief. So the second group of people mentioned in this surah are the Kufar. Kufar is also a generic term referring to those who outwardly and openly deny Allah. They decline his guidance, and worst of all, they denounce his very presence. They refuse to admit that he even exists. As far as they are concerned, Allah either does not exist, or if he does exist, he has no value or impact in the life of the human person. Especially here in the West, in this 20th century, coming into this 21st century, they have developed a myriad of philosophies, ideologies, and dogmas that have been invented to prove that Allah, God, does not exist. And even if he does, he's, he's no longer really necessary as a manager over human affairs. We got this. All of what I'm telling you is in the Quran. Allah's hands are tied. Allah is poor. We are rich. In previous scriptures, and on the seventh day, God rested from all of the work that he had done. Well, well then who takes over the work? They didn't put that in the Bible. They attempt to minimize and marginalize Allah and package him as a Sunday school attraction. The people don't even think about God until Sunday. Or they package him as a, a, a Sabbath psalmist. We're going to the shul to hear what Yahweh, what Elohim has to say today. It's Saturday. Some have even packaged Allah as a Friday phenomenon. Hmm? Oh, it's Juma. <laughs> Read my verses from the Quran. Let me go to Juma. Juma over. Back to the world. Some of us are 
foolish enough to say, back to the real world now. <laughs> you just left the real world. <laughs> oh, my goodness. These ideas are the pollutants that many of us as religious adherents have breathed into our systems. And the stench of this Kaffir cow dung mentality has gradually replaced the sweet-smelling fragrance of Allah's ruh in us. You mentioned the name of Jesus in the church, everybody goes, ooh! You mentioned the name Muhammad in most masjid. And the Muslims go, sallallahu wa sallam. They liven up. You mentioned the name of Allah, everybody gets silent. And you can almost feel the drain on the intellect. Because God, quote unquote, has been packaged and presented to most of us by Satan himself. In a way to suggest that God is eternally interested in our punishment and our damnation to hell. Waiting for you to step in the master with your left foot. So he can punish you. Waiting for you to look two seconds longer into a sister's gaze. So he can condemn you. Our book calls him Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. The merciful, the merciful. And there are numerous ways to interpret those two mercies. We like to say that the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. So when the Christian comes into our company, they can feel comfortable also. Because they believe in a redeemer. We're just giving them the proper idea of what a redeemer is. The intention of the kuffar is to replace Allah's power with their own power. Their militaristic power as well as their political power. Now I'm not just talking about sophisticated militaries like the United States possesses or like Russia possesses, or like China possesses. I'm talking about little fiefdoms that we create among ourselves. Our little military is me and my three boys. And I come to you and I'm doing the negotiating and the talking, and they're all looking at you like original gangsters. That's his military. Or the sister that's trying to uh, intimidate another sister. That's her military. Trying to work their ideas into your plans and programs without entering through the proper doors. That's their political power. Following what Allah has to say in the Quran about the Kufar, Allah gives us a succeeding 13 ayat exposing the works of the Munafiq. There are four verses speaking on the Mutaki in Al-Baqarah, followed by two verses, only two verses on the Kufar. But 13 verses on the Munafiq. What does that tell you? <laughs> the Munafiq in the history of our deen and its establishment does not come into existence until a formidable force develops among Muslims. And we're talking now mainly not about Mecca, but after the Prophet and his society, his community, arrived in Medina. That's when the Munafik began to show themselves. <laughs> they are known to express allegiance to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, while professing secret allegiance to Satan. Behind the closed door. We are really with you. We, we said we believe when we were with them, but we are we were just mocking. We, we're really down with you. Well, why are they down with Satan? Because Satan promises them nothing. <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> the devil promises you nothing. <laughs> And nothing's plenty for me. You know what I mean? <laughs> I've got plenty of nothing and nothing's but they had us singing those songs. Foolish people. <laughs> Be 
before the Muslims had a power base, when Muslims were being persecuted in the land of Mecca, there was only the Kufar. There were no Munafiq. There was only the Kufar. And they would show open opposition to the uh, nascent body of Muslims. But once Muslims gained a foothold of power, the Kufar were forced in many cases to go underground. And when they returned to the surface, they returned as Munafik. These are not simple people who we call hypocrites. Oh man, you said something different today than you said yesterday, man. You told me I could ride on your bike today, and now you're telling me I can't ride. You're a hypocrite. <laughs> you see how weak that word is in common language? Well, why would we apply that to what Allah is saying about this group of people whose intentions were to squash out the entire Muslim Ummah. And ain't just no hypocrite. Hypocrite comes from the same root as the word hypodermic. It means somebody who just who gets under your skin. In the Arabic language, it means one who goes into one hole and comes out of another. He goes in, la ilaha illallah, he's doing and he's looking at his watch because he is meeting with the, the secret society people. is in about an hour. He's got to make his report. They exist solely for self-interest and opportunism. They have no real commitment to either side. They are always ready to be on the side of the perceived winner. They recognize the power of Allah while they're in public, but they have no genuine commitment to Allah when behind closed doors. Lastly, Allah says concerning them, خَتَمْ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ وَعَلَىٰ سَمْعِهِمْ وَعَلَىٰ أَبْصَارِهِمْ غِشَابَةٌ وَلَهُمْ أَذَابُونَ عَظِيمٌ That the seal of Allah, Allah's seal, is upon their hearts, him, and upon their hearing, him, and on their eyes, him, is a veil. And those eyes do not represent your physical eyes. They represent your ability to gain insight. Allah denies them that insight. And for them awaits a tremendously grievous penalty. I thought you said Allah was not interested in beating us up. Just the fact that you said that means something wrong in your heart. Because if you are a righteous Muslim, that's not your fear. Mm -hmm. huh? If you are a righteously intended, uh, intentioned person, you are looking at those verses in the Quran that talk about the reward <laughs> for goodness, the reward for sabakah, the reward for salat and zakat. And you, you, you're trying to tabulate that. Man, if I can just keep up all five, I'm going to miss it between now and Ramadan. If I can keep up all five, or at least during Ramadan, if I can make sure I got all five and the, and the supererogatory prayers and the, this and, and the dicker and the nighttime, and you add it, me and my wife, we go home, we got a chart on the wall. So, man, Ramadan is, we're going to all go back to our default setting on Ramadan. Did you make Fajr? Yes. Did you make good? Yes. Did you do this? Yes. Did you do Sodom? Yes. Did you help somebody? Yes. Did you do and we check this stuff off every day. I worry about no uh, terrible punishment unless I know I'm doing some terrible action. Then I'm increasing those prayers, increasing that sadaqah, increasing that goodness with the help of Allah. So we conclude with this idea concerning the word cafe. And there's much to be said on these terms. And uh, inshallah, we'll be invited back for a, a, a longer exposition of these words along with other terminology in the Quran. I want you to think about today's modern world, today's world, and the application of this terminology, keeping in mind that the Quran was revealed more for the future than it was for the time in which it was revealed. Allah says that he will reward and punish people 
we've read this interpretation, down to an atom's weight. You've heard that? In the time of Muhammad the Prophet, 7th century Arabia, never knew anything about an ATOM. Interesting, they call those money machines ATMs, right? That, that just came to me. And we, we keep extracting from them. Yeah, what happens when you spend out all the atoms? <laughs> no more creation. Maybe that's what the devil wants. He said, I'm going to come from before them. That's what they put that ATM to, right? Right there before you. <laughs> from behind them, their right and their left. And when I get finished, it won't be one worthy of being in your presence, Allah, except for your purified. In today's society, we have major industries, major corporations, such as that which exists in the food industries and also the drug or pharmaceutical industries. Major industries that control the wealth and that control the potential for good or for harm in the average life of the average human person. There are people old enough in this audience to remember when grandma or granddad would go into the backyard and pull out the beans, the green beans, the tomatoes, pull the fruit off of the trees. If we were bad, they would have us pull the switches off of the trees. <laughs> and that would become dinner, breakfast. There are people right now in certain countries, they grow their own animals. Even in this country, we have Muslims now who are getting more and more into the business of growing their own halal, halal products. That is what Muslim community life is supposed to do. But those of us who still allow for our lives to be put into the hands of people who have proven over and over again that they do not have our best interests at heart, we put our lives into the hands of people who, according to the way I'm reading the book, represent the same kind of kufar influence and monafic existence as those that existed 1400 years ago. It's just that it's taking on worldwide proportions. The technology has stepped itself up exponentially. If I tell you this is a tomato, Huh? You want to see some? You, you know, Moses had to deal with the magicians, right? Well, I'm going to show you modern day magic. I show you a tomato and I say, this is a tomato. Tomato might be this big, right? And you've never been used to seeing tomatoes this big. Now you're starting to know about genetic modification of foods, fruits, and etc., meats, and so forth. But they show you this tomato and they say, that, go eat that, put that tomato, slice that up, put it in your salad. That's good for you. Tomato equals good, right? Natural, Allah made it good. But you don't realize until you read up on it that this tomato has actually had the genes of rats spliced into it. Rat, R-A-T, spliced genetically into and combined with the DNA of the tomato. You say, now why would they do something crazy? That sounds like Frankenstein stuff. Well, that's where they got it. They do that so that the insects that normally feed off of that fruit will instinctively recognize rat when they approach the tomato. So your vision is seeing tomato, their sensory perception is seeing rat. So what are you reading? They just recently had in the news, halal meats. If we thought were halal. But they're saying that because chicken is measured or weighed in a way that includes water as a part of its markup value. If you can inject the flesh of the chicken with water, it brings greater value when you take it to the market. But in order to consolidate the water within the context of the chicken flesh, you have to have particular kinds of protein 
to solidify it. Their choices are beef protein, vegetable protein, or pork protein. Guess which one of those three happened to be the cheapest? So they put the pork protein in the meat product and sell it to you as halal. Not the Muslims doing this. All the Muslim knows is they said this is halal. But they're not aware of the mechanics. Allah is telling us or allowing us to, to, to see these things to let us know what our obligation is now and into the future if we want to be a real community of Muslims in America. Lastly, I'd like to say, I'd like to give you some advice from Imam Wadhuddin Muhammad. May Allah forgive him his sins, grant him paradise. He said that the problem with black people and government, the problem between black people and government is that because we've been stripped of everything, we do not have a viable government that we bring to America. So we depend on the overriding government, which is actually only supposed to be an ancillary government that serves as a, uh, an umbrella of protection for your smaller government. So Muslims from other countries come here and they come with their idea of smaller government for their family, for the community that they're developing. The Japanese come here, they come with their own form of government. Other people come from other parts of the world with their own idea for government. And the American government is only supposed to protect the rights of them to perform activities based on their own government. They're not trying to push Sharia on Detroit. They're trying to push Sharia in the five block radius that they have established for their Muslim lives. And America is supposed to protect that right. But our people, because we don't have an insular government, we depend on proper government for all of the essentials that that government was not set up to supply. So we're putting undue burden on Papa government. They're running around with a guilt complex trying to do this and legislate that and change another law. And what more do we want? Not that many decades ago, we couldn't walk the streets of most cities in the South and in the North freely as black-skinned men and women. You look at a white person wrong. That might have been you hanging from the tree that night. Strange fruit talking about tomatoes. Strange fruit. Billy Holiday. Go listen to it. Don't be spooky. So today all of that has been eradicated. Enough for us to walk freely and talk as crazily as we want to in the public, on the bus, on the, in the highways and byways, and nobody says anything. People just look at you like, well, that's an uncivilized person. There was a time when that was unheard of. 17-year-old boy on a bus, listening to his rap song, cussing and fussing on the bus, talking to himself, rapping, rapping, and what could be his grandmother sitting right next to him, or maybe standing in front of him because he refused to give her his seat. We have been made crazy. Not all of us, but too many of us. Not even the majority of us. The majority of us are surprisingly civilized blessed by Allah to have come through that kind of history and still have any sanity is a miracle from God. That's right. That's right. Think about that. Brought here on the backs of ships, dumped into a land that we were totally unfamiliar with, made to work for not a week, a month, 300 straight years with another hundred of Jim Crow lynching and abuse. And because people decided to stand up for their own integrity, even if it meant the loss of life, things changed so that these generations, our generations, could walk freely in the land of the free called America. And we won't even give America the time of day. Imam Muhammad said when he runs around the track and he sees the American flag, he salutes it. How many of y'all got that kind of heart? You want to be nationalists and blame everything on proper government. Well, a time is coming that we call the Great Elimination. And you know, an elimination can also be a bowel movement. Mm. <laughs> so if you hear a tremendous flush, 
and you're still standing, praises be to Allah. <laughs> because all you have to do to avoid the great elimination is do what Allah told you to do. Be right. Be a dignified Muslim, which means being an upright person, human being. The difference between the average upright person and the Muslim is the Muslim is totally and thoroughly conscious of their obligation and relationship with Allah. That's the difference. What does Allah ask me to do on a day-to-day -day basis? That is our obligation that will keep us out of the fires of hell that begin in this life and extend for as long as you create the conditions for its extension. You should be trying to create the difference for its extinction. What do you call it? Extinguishing. Extinguish the fire. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi ala kulli nimmatan wa astaghfirullah min kulli dhanbin wa asaluhu min kulli khayr wa a'udhu billahi min kulli shah. The definitive praise belongs to Allah for all of the blessings of this civilized life and we ask Allah to forgive us for our sins, give us that which is beneficial and keep us away from all that which is potentially harmful. Alhamdulillah, iqamatu salat.